Hello and welcome to the Civil War Project, where I'm retracing Civil War history one person, place, and event at a time. The first two episodes of Manhunt on Apple TV Plus dropped on March 15th, and today I'm going to do a recap of episode one titled Pilot. Two things first. First, in the second trailer of Manhunt that they put out, they focused on three groups, the conspirators, the hunters, and the informants. The main characters fall within these three groups, so that is something to keep in mind. Second, this is a recap. Just because I'm describing something doesn't mean it actually happened. To make things simple, I'm largely sticking to the story the creators chose to tell, though I might occasionally make a few brief comments here and there. What I will be doing in the next few days is posting a video that will go through the main events and point out what is fact, fiction, or somewhere in between, and we'll be providing some additional details so you can know the real or complete story. If you're interested, make sure to hit the subscribe and notification buttons so you don't miss it. So let's talk Manhunt, episode one. The first episode starts off just like the trailer, with John Wilkes Booth getting ready in his hotel room at the National Hotel the evening of April 14th, 1865. I think this has to be the best booth I have ever seen in film or TV, with the exception of Adam Scott's hilarious interpretation in the TV show Drunk History several years ago. Outside, there's a sequence of yet unnamed persons holding one-on-one -on -one meetings throughout Washington. We'll learn that these are some of the conspirators, David Harold, Lewis Powell, Mary Surratt, and George Otzerott. Booth, Powell, and Atzerat are armed, as they will be the ones assassinating three key people in the U.S. government tonight. President Abraham Lincoln, Secretary of State William Seward, and Vice President Andrew Johnson. First up is Lewis Powell, who is in charge of killing Seward, though he ironically doesn't even know who Seward is. Who is this guy, he asks his buddy Harold, who answers, he's Secretary of State. Harold looks at Powell's face to see if he gets it. He doesn't. What state? He asks Harold, who is now clearly thinking, my goodness, this guy is dumb. Well, Powell might be dumb, but he's going to prove his worth physically tonight. It's important to note that Harold picks up Powell at Mary Surratt's boarding house in Washington. She even helps him into his coat and gives this little smirk as he leaves. Noticing all of this is informant number one, Louis Weichmann, who slowly goes down the stairs in his uniform as he watches with suspicion. At Seward's, Harold holds their getaway horse while Powell rushes madly through the house, stabbing and beating anyone who stands in his path to Seward. He tried shooting them too, but his gun jammed, just like it had several times earlier that day when he was practicing with it. When Seward's daughter Fanny opens a window and starts shouting for help and screaming murder, Harold freaks out and makes a hasty exit on his horse, leaving behind a confused and bloodied Powell to find his own way through and out of the city. Given how few brain cells he seems to have, I think it's safe to say he's going to have trouble. We are then introduced to the main protagonist of the series, a beardless Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, who is going to go into major sleuth slash detective mode in this first episode, trying to find clues of how all this could happen and who is involved. I admit, without the beard, he kind of reminds me of Sherlock Holmes more than he does Stanton, but I'm getting used to him and hopefully you will too. Stanton is the first hunter. We see flashbacks of celebration five days prior at the War Department when the news came over the telegraph that Confederate General Robert E. Lee had agreed to the surrender term set out by U.S. General Ulysses S. Grant. What's funny is that while waiting for that telegraph, they get one from U.S. General William Tecumseh Sherman, who is commanding his army in Raleigh, North Carolina, who lets them know he's about to take the Confederate city. I'm thrilled to see Sherman's name mentioned, but the rest of the group look pretty glum as they're really wanting to hear from Grant. Poor Sherman. Then we see Stanton at Seward's home before the attack, where Seward is convalescing after a horrible carriage accident that left him with broken bones and a broken jaw, which has resulted in Seward wearing an odd neck brace. Stanton wants to discuss reconstruction, but Seward reminds him that there are still armies in the field, and he is expecting a last-minute attempt by the Confederacy to try and save themselves. 
We are then back with Booth, who is drinking away at the Star Saloon next door to Ford's Theater, where he has a lengthy discussion with Abraham Lincoln's bodyguard for the night, John Parker. Yes, Lincoln's bodyguard is at the saloon, much to Booth's amusement and the viewers, I suspect. From their discussion, we learn Booth is not only a racist, but also not nearly as popular as his father and older brother Edwin when it comes to famous actors. And boy, does that bother him. Parker tries to give him advice, saying people would like him more if maybe he played the good guy once in a while, and Booth clearly looks uncomfortable with that thought. Photos of his father and brother are on the wall of the saloon, which just irritates him internally even more. I think it's safe to say the guy has jealousy issues. It turns out that Booth found out the president was coming to Ford's that evening when he stopped by to get his mail earlier, so he has planned this whole assassination scheme within a 10 to 12 hour time span. It's a good thing, too, because when Booth was waiting for the guy to fetch his mail, he couldn't help but notice his father and brother's photo also on their lobby wall. He asks one of the staff, a guy named Jesse, why his photo isn't on the wall, to which Jesse responds, they are legends. Way to go, Jesse. You just gave Booth the perfect idea to make himself a bigger legend than his father and brother combined. But unlike his two family members, he is going to be a legend in the worst way. Booth knows the play Lincoln is watching by heart, so when the funniest line of the play hits, Booth shoots. There is a spectacular scene that follows with Booth stabbing and pushing his way out of the theater, but not before yelling some extravagant over-the-top lines to the shunned and confused crowd to help showcase his reasons behind this horrific act. He gets away via his horse, which is being held by John Burroughs, also known as John Peanut, for the salty snacks he sells at Ford's, and John is freaked out. He is also informant number two. Ned Spangler, a stagehand at Ford's, had forced Burroughs earlier to hold Booth's horse in the back alley of Ford's, and of course in doing so also had to make a crude remark about Burroughs' mixed race background. When Booth leaves out the back door, it's Spangler opening it for him and trying to hold it shut to avoid anyone running after Booth. This makes him one more of the conspirators. He is successful in slowing down one man who eventually breaks through the door to chase after Booth, the one person out of the entire theater who thought to do so. He of course is unsuccessful on foot in catching up to Booth on his horse. Burroughs sees all of this and finally gets the courage to inform Stanton of what he saw when Stanton is at Ford's walking around trying to figure out how one man could assassinate the president in front of 1,500 people and escape. Booth manages to cross the closed for the night Navy Yard Bridge, the only way out of town due to his name and the fact that the Union Guard and his wife loved watching him on stage. The guard is also one more person who says that Booth looks smaller in person, and Booth is left to hide how much that little statement bothers him. Wait, maybe I shouldn't use the word little in that sentence as, you know, it might offend him. Anyway, Booth meets up with Harold in Maryland, and they arrive at Dr. Samuel Mudd's house about 35 miles south of Washington for him to fix Booth's leg that Booth broke when he jumped from the presidential box to the stage. It's clearly daytime, which is really wrong, but I'll discuss that more in my facts versus fiction video. While in bed, one of Mudd's African-American servants, who used to be an enslaved person before slavery became illegal, Mary Sims is there to make him coffee. A very drunk Booth, who has been drinking whiskey by the bottle for his pain, flirts and acts completely inappropriately until Dr. Mudd comes back and tells Mary that she is to tell her brother William that a splint is to be made. When Mary states that her brother's been working overtime on a latrine for Dr. Mudd, he threatens her and says, you know, I already had to teach your brother a lesson last year. I really don't want to have to teach you the same. What a great guy, huh? After some painful screams from Booth when Mud pulls his leg back into place, he is completely jubilant when Harold gives him a newspaper that says that Booth is a symbol of the cause. I'm a symbol, Davy, Booth exclaims like a small child. I noticed that when he read the major headlines of the article about our beloved president, 
He seemed a bit annoyed, but that symbol status really cheered him up. Kind of hard to imagine why anyone would want to be a symbol that stands for treating an entire race of people like they are less than barn animals. But that's just the kind of guy Booth is. In the meantime, Stanton arrives on 10th Street and runs into Parker. Stanton asks what happened and Parker tells him that the president has been shot and witnesses are saying it's John Wilkes Booth. Stanton is like, um, where the heck were you? He grabs Parker by the collar, shaking him, but Parker is just speechless. I mean, what can he say at this point? Major fail there, Parker. You had a very simple job. Watch a play and guard a presidential box. Stanton makes his way into the Peterson house across the street from Ford's, where the Lincoln's eldest son, Robert, is pushing a bunch of total strangers away, telling them that there's nothing to see there. I mean, his father is dying, and people are trying to not only get a glimpse, but a relic. Ah, humanity never ceases to amaze me. So Robert sees Stanton and immediately starts blaming him. Why did Stanton let his father go to Ford's? It was just five days after the surrender. How could Stanton have pushed him to free African Americans and give them the vote? It was too fast. Okay, I have to stop here. I don't know why, but Hollywood really likes making Robert Lincoln into something he's not. The poor guy deserves an accurate portrayal, but it seems we're not going to be getting it here. Stanton brushes it off and makes his way to the end of the hall, where Mary Lincoln is being told off and shoved out of her husband's room. I admit, this scene really made me tear up, and it shocked me. To be fair, I have spent countless hours learning and thinking about that night, and the more I learned, the more I truly felt sorry for this misunderstood woman. I know so many people dislike Mary, but I think we need to start to realize all she had been through in her life in a time without any mental or trauma therapy. This little scene just broke my heart because there's a lot of truth there, and I doubted actress Lily Taylor could pull it off, but I'll say here that I take it back. Mary then sees Parker, who has the nerve to show his face again, bad choice. Mary starts screaming at him, asking him where he was, that he was supposed to be guarding him. Notice how she says him, not us. She just keeps repeating, I have given my husband to die, before realizing that Abraham was going to die. Why didn't Booth kill me? She just keeps whimpering. Stanton tells Robert to take her back home to the White House, but Mary makes a good point. If her husband dies, she has no home. She begs Stanton not to swear in Vice President Andrew Johnson. I think I can safely say that most of the country at that point didn't want him sworn in either. She starts to spiral again and Stanton yells at her and tells her that it's no time for hysterics. And it's not a great look for Stanton, but one can also say that what she was expressing on the outside was how he was feeling on the inside. But as Secretary of War, he didn't have the luxury of letting all that emotion out. The Lincoln deathbed is an incredibly gruesome scene audibly and visually. And after hours of waiting, the president dies at 7.22 a.m. on Saturday, April 15, 1865. After a moment of silence, Stanton states, now he belongs to the angels. A pine box is produced to be used as a temporary coffin, which Stanton feels the president wouldn't mind, as Abraham always thought of himself as a rail splitter. Outside, oddly spaced apart, African Americans and others watch as the coffin is carried down the steps of the Peterson house. People are silently weeping. If they weren't all spaced out, it would be slightly more impactful, but it still hits right at the heart. As they take the coffin to the wagon that will carry it to the White House, African Americans are straining to tenderly touch the coffin of the president that gave them freedom and rights that they should have had from the very beginning. It's not just the death of a man, but also the potential death of that freedom and those rights, and you can feel it very strongly in this scene. Stanton, who admits he is a horrible delegator, takes complete charge of identifying who is behind all of this, in addition to helping in the war, dealing with disruptive press, and even distasteful street peddlers who are trying to sell relics having to do with the president, including a mask of the president taken two months ago, a playbill from that horrible night, and a sconce that the peddler took off the wall at the Peterson house. Stanton hasn't even gotten around to the new president. Where is Andrew Johnson, I wonder? 
Turns out, after Lincoln dies, Stanton gets the news that they caught the first conspirator, George Atzerodt, at the Kirkwood house. George has admitted that he was there to kill the vice president, but lost his nerve. That was certainly quick. Too quick. No, really, look out for my facts versus fiction video to learn what really happened. The episode closes with Stanton and Thomas Eckert, Hunter number two, and Booth's hotel room at the National. Stanton finds papers with codes on it. Eckert, who runs the Washington Telegraphs, doesn't recognize the pattern. Next, Stanton finds a mini ball to go with the Derringer pistol he found on the floor of the presidential box earlier, which Booth had used to shoot the president. The pistol only held one around, so obviously Booth left it there as he didn't need some dead weight of a useless pistol in his jacket. Eckert tells Stanton that he found a bank book showing a deposit for $500. It's for an account under Booth's name. That in itself isn't so shocking, but the next part is. It's for a bank in Montreal, Canada, and it's the one the Confederate Secret Service have been using to launder money. They don't just use that bank, they control it, says Stanton. Eckert says the thing Stanton can't bring himself to say. What if the Confederacy is behind the assassination? Looking sick to his stomach and very overwhelmed by responsibility, Stanton responds, I'd have to start another war. Oh, and did I mention that Stanton is very unwell? He has serious asthma, and it appears to be perilously close to not just impacting his career, but possibly his very existence. And just because there are some fictional scenes in this episode, I do want to make it clear that Stanton's bad health is unfortunately very real. I've really enjoyed going through this. I can't wait to see the other six episodes. It truly is kind of a great murder mystery, even though I know all of it. It's still really drawing me in, and I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with it, much more than I thought I would be. So that is the recap for Manhunt, episode one. Thank you for joining me. If you've liked what you've seen, please hit like, subscribe, and hit notification if you want to get future videos. I'm off to do the recap for episode two, which also dropped this same day. And as always, I bid you an affectionate farewell. <laughs>